Mario has done a lot in 35 years. He's cleaned graffiti off an island resort, traveled the globe and the galaxies beyond, and saved the Mushroom Kingdom more times than I care to count. But through it all, the mustache plumber's identity has remained impressively consistent. Mario is Mario, no matter what the window dressing is. But Nintendo's confidence in the little guy had to come from somewhere. They worked tirelessly over his first few adventures to whittle down the best bits of his core characteristics. And once they identified their winning formula, the team that redefined gaming was ready to raise the bar once again. Hi there, my name is Daniel, and I think Super Mario World is super creative. Dang, this game is amazing. Perfect stages, perfect music, perfect mechanics, perfect balance, perfect Yoshi. If you don't pick up this game right now, you are a- Sorry, did I come on too strong? My bad. You know, tell you what, let's start at the beginning and see how we got here, okay? Mario was on an absolute roll by 1990. With three groundbreaking titles on the NES and one on the Game Boy, the plumber had not only revolutionized the gaming industry, he had continued to shatter expectations and raise the bar for his competition with each new release. And now, Mario was paving the way for the next generation of games. Nintendo was about to release their new 16-bit console, the Super Nintendo, and they needed a powerhouse to show off what the new system was capable of. Nintendo had spent the last five years refining Mario's core gameplay, and now with more powerful hardware, it was time to give players the definitive Super Mario experience. The first thing any longtime fan of the series will notice in this title is that Mario's movement is more fluid than it has ever been. His acceleration and running speed feel nice and believable. His turnaround time, both on the ground and in the air, feel fair and easy to work with, yet still grounded with a sense of momentum. And his jump feels nice and springy without feeling overly floaty. Now, I've talked in previous episodes about how wooden and stiff some of Mario's previous movement mechanics were, especially in his first game. And this can be largely chalked up to the fact that Super Mario World was my first and most formative experience with the series. But playing through the games in order now, I have a whole new appreciation for just how far Mario's team at Nintendo has come in five short years. But Mario's not forgetting his roots anytime soon, which is why you'll be seeing his trusty fire flower a lot in this adventure. And it functions exactly the same way as it always has, with the added bonus of giving you this cool flurry attack when it's used in tandem with Mario's new spin jump. But that's not the only thing in Mario's toolkit this time around. He's also got the brand new Kate Feather, which pretty much takes the place of the Tanuki suit from the previous game. Power-ups that let Mario fly have become a bit of a series staple at this point. But for me, there are none more iconic than Mario's cape, which allows him to soar proudly into the air and pretty much fly indefinitely until the end of the stage. Yeah, that last bit could have been toned down a little bit, I think. And as far as power-ups, that's pretty much it. Keeping with the theme of refining what came before it, Mario World is much more interested in bringing together the best bits of Mario's design than experimenting with wacky ideas like its predecessor. But that's not to say there's nothing new in this game, because I've neglected to mention perhaps the most iconic addition to Mario's gang that the series has seen yet. Yoshi isn't just another power-up, he's a friend, a companion for Mario along this dark and harrowing journey, a comrade in arms to- wait, what? Did he- did he just die? And did- and did Mario just push him into a pit for an extra jump? Oh my. Mario, wipe that grin off your face! Your friend is dead! If this was Breath of the Wild, you'd have a lot of explaining to do. I guess they don't seem to care too much though. Anyway. Yoshi is such a fascinating addition to the series, because while it certainly is a hilarious idea to think of a plumber riding a dinosaur into battle, Mario's new friend just feels right at home in this world. And part of that, of course, is because this game does take place in Yoshi's world, not the Mushroom Kingdom. Bowser's gotten sick of getting kicked around time and time again in his old stomping grounds, so this time, he set his sights on a place called Dinosaur Land and he's brought his trusty Koopalings to establish amicable, diplomatic relationships with its citizens. And among those denizens are the Yoshis, a species of good-natured dinosaurs sporting a variety of different color variations. They love to eat and seem to grow, like, weirdly fast. <laughs> Seriously, what's the lifespan of a Yoshi? Jeez. And whereas previous adventures would see Mario fighting to rescue the Mushroom Kingdom's toads, this time, it's the Yoshis who need his help. 
I think the thing that I love most about Yoshi's implementation in this game is that it feels like such a natural, synergistic connection between narrative and gameplay. And yes, I just use the term narrative when discussing a Mario game. And call it what you want, but one of the biggest reasons Nintendo games often feel so polished and refined is that, for them, narrative and gameplay are intimately connected. Why does Ocarina of Time revolve around a sacred flute? Because they wanted music to be part of the gameplay. And why does Super Metroid maroon Samus on a desolate planet alone? Because they wanted the player to feel the satisfaction of untying the world's knot on their own. And why, in this game, does Mario work side by side with a green dinosaur? Because Nintendo has wanted Mario to ride a green dinosaur ever since the original Super Mario Bros. Seriously, look that one up. Miyamoto had also toyed around with the idea of Mario riding a horse, but honestly, Yoshi just feels so much more perfect. These two are the dream team, and together they feel like the perfect culmination of Nintendo's best ideas on display. Did someone say ideas? Oh wait, that was me. Well, I'm glad I did, because that's the perfect transition into the other crux of the Mario series, the stages. Perhaps the only thing to suitably match the nuance of Mario's mechanics is the creativity that Nintendo pours into these many, many unique levels. I mean, these are just playgrounds for Mario, really. Yes, some of them are pretty devious, but the wackiness, oh, the wackiness, always turned up to 11. Now, we've already talked at length about the creative stage design in Mario games, so I don't want to waste time going over the obvious again. I mean, it almost feels cliche to talk about how finely tuned the stages in Mario games feel how the creative ideas consistently impress, but don't overstay their welcome. And nowhere is that truer than right here. I don't know if it's even possibly to empirically measure fun, but if it is, Nintendo somehow figured it out and pretty much used this game to brag about it. I'm genuinely trying to think of moments that were grueling or annoying in my many playthroughs of this game, and honestly, I can't. Call me biased, and please feel free to sound off your most annoying Super Mario World stage in the comments below. But I feel pretty confident saying that this game's stages are the culmination of everything Nintendo's A-Team has learned up to this point. But the creativity doesn't stop when Mario hits that goalpost, because this is Super Mario World, not Super Mario Stage. Was that cheesy? Yeah, that was cheesy. Anyway, sorry. In Super Mario Bros. 3, we saw the addition of world maps, visual representations of the game's eight realms that helped ground the player and sell the Mushroom Kingdom as a believable place. These worlds also provided some interesting choices and diverging paths, but that was kind of it. But now, all of those disparate worlds have been mashed together into one contiguous world map, and those choices offered by Mario 3's maps have been ratcheted up considerably as well. Let's take the first two worlds of each game, for example. Mario 3's Grasslands offer a couple paths to choose from along the way, but the critical path from stage one to the castle is clear. But then we bring it over to Yoshi's Island and BAM! Right away, we're hit with a fork in the road. Both options leading obviously to different locations. And I mean, it's pretty obvious the game wants you to go to the castle over here, but this left path just looks so tantalizing. And exploring it will lead you to this completely optional yellow switch, which turns all of these into these. Besides that though, the rest of the world is pretty straightforward until you take down Iggy and hop on over to the Donut Plains. And this is where things get a real crazy. So moving back over to Mario 3, World 2's Desert Land essentially has the same design ethos as the previous world, albeit about twice the size. Some branching paths here and there, but overall pretty straightforward. But in the Donut Plains? Oh no no no. You see this red dot here? That means that this stage, the first of many, contains a secret exit. Clearing it the normal way will open up this path to the left, but finding this handy dandy key right here will lead you straight to the bottom of this lake, where you'll find another stage with a secret exit. And then if you find that key, there's a ghost house with yet another secret exit and a secret boss this time. Even in such a small area, there are so many options to choose from. And of course, all of them are completely viable paths through the game's second world and they only become more ambitious from here on out. World 3's Vanilla Dome has two completely different critical paths with two separate castles that lead to two unique versions of the game's fourth bridge-based area. Like it's a freaking Star Fox game. But what's that? Oh yeah, this one came first. The world map is no longer just a virtual bin to hold all the game's stages. Now, it's interconnected with the stages to create a truly immersive ebb and flow in the game's experience. 
From secret exits to secret paths to entire secret worlds, every inch of dinosaur land is just begging to be explored. Hidden secrets and alternate paths have always been a part of Mario's DNA since day one. And Mario World is simply displaying the logical growth of this identity. Playing through Super Mario World is not just plotting a straight line from World 1 to 8. It's so much more than that. Dinosaur Land has a real sense of identity that makes it feel like a real place I'm getting to explore, rather than just a set of video game stages. Super Mario World is my favorite Mario game, full stop. I think I've made that pretty clear. But even apart from that, I would still argue that this masterpiece brings the best the Mario series has to offer. Miyamoto's team spent five grueling years whittling down the best bits of Mario's core identity, and Mario World just blends those together and serves them up on a silver platter. Mario games are about fun, and Nintendo provides that fun through masterful mechanics, creative platforming, and rewarding exploration. It's been such a joy getting to watch this identity develop over Mario's first handful of adventures, and Super Mario World just feels like a celebration of all that hard work. And while Mario certainly isn't finished throwing down on everyone's expectations with his creativity and fun, it's still difficult for me to find another game in this series that epitomizes his identity as well as this one. Sometimes moving forward is riddled with questions, apprehension, and fear. And sometimes you're just on a roll with a confidence that says, Come at me, world. I'm freaking Mario. Well, that's what he says, you know, in his Mario voice. Maybe just, I don't know, insert your name there? You know what I mean. So just like I applauded the hard-earned victories of Mario's earlier adventures, I also want to celebrate the moments when Mario just flexes on his competitors. This game is platforming. It may not have invented the wheel, but to this day, it's one of the best dang wheels there are. I grew up with this mentality that I always had to be struggling in some regard, as if saying things were actually going great was never a satisfactory answer. I don't know where this exactly came from, but this idea that I'm only being real if I have something to complain about doesn't really sit well with me anymore. Yes, some seasons are hard and sucky, and that certainly needs to be talked about and processed. But where is the joy in life if the story stops there every single time? Celebrating the beauty in each season is just as real and honest as recognizing its flaws. In fact, I would argue that in the long run, it's more important. And I'm not talking about blind optimism here. No, I don't wanna to lie to myself about how everything is perfect in my life. But I'm also not about to lie to myself and say that everything sucks either, because that's simply not true. Today, I'm wrestling through some extremely painful health issues, and I'm stressing over what the next few years will look like for my family. But I'm also incredibly grateful for the life I do have, the breath in my lungs, the elusive good night's rest that I actually got last night. I got to have a few seconds this morning to sit outside and just breathe in the fresh air, thanking my God for the beautiful planet he's created. Of course, today isn't perfect, just like this game isn't perfect. Believe me, I can always find things to nitpick, but I want to give myself permission to celebrate the beauty before me today and find joy in it. And that's all she wrote, y'all. This episode was the end of my first season discussing the Mario series. And I just want to say thank you for hanging out and celebrating these wonderful games with me. I can't wait to dive into the 3D titles, but before that, we're switching gears and bringing things to the world of JRPGs as we discuss Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy next season. That's coming real soon, so hit that subscribe button to stay in the loop. Hope you have a wonderful and joy-filled day. See y'all later.